All right, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us and being here with us today. My name is Angelina Darasa, and I'm the founder and CEO of C-Suite Coach. I'm really excited to be with you. This is a topic that is near and dear to us. Every month, we have C-Suite Coach chats with an executive uh, expert in their craft, as well as our C-Suite coaches. So if you didn't know, C-Suite Coach is an organization that offers a bunch of resources to upskill and support black and brown communities. So primarily we offer coach staffing. We source a very vetted expert group of coaches to develop black and brown leaders within organizations and small business communities as well. We always have a C-suite coach on a C-suite coach chat. So excited that repping today, we actually have two, Sharon McClung and Marcel Fowler. Really excited to hear from them. We also do operational support for diversity programs and leadership development content. So if you're interested in learning more about our services, you can check us out at csweetcoach.com and also through the scroll that you see can get a sampling and idea of what we do. But I wanna spend the bulk of our time focused on what we're here to talk about today. And I see some of you putting in the chat some great, great questions, some comments. Um, some vulnerable answers to what you're hoping to get out today. So we will, we want to spend all of our time addressing this. I will just kick it off by saying why this topic is so interesting to me is because I feel that I spent so much energy in my life and so much time really feeling like I wasn't good enough and it helped me back. And you get to a point in your career where you have to wake up and say, there's just too many proof points that demonstrate the opposite. So me not believing in myself is really wasting time. I'm wasting time getting done the things I could be done, getting the things I want to be getting done. And that's really where we wanna focus. We wanna focus on pursuing our, our full goals, our full dreams and, and not playing small. But we'll talk about lots more. Before we do that, I do want to turn it over to one of our amazing coaches, Sharon LaRue McClung, who presents dynamic webinars and one-on-one -on -one coaching to career transition, job seekers, and software engineering, data science, cybersecurity, and UI UX. She's also enjoyed partnering with C-Suite Coach to provide one-on-one -on -one coaching at Cup Fellows Leadership Institute, Veterans Future Lab at New York University's Tandon School, as well as Year Up. She's currently a writer with Dorset Theater Festival's Women's Artist Writing Group and a core company member with GF & Co Studio Lab. She holds a BFA in acting from Carnegie Mellon University, and she comes from a world of speech and debate, acting, ballet, and yoga. She can stand up for herself, do stand-up comedy, stand on her toes, and stand on her head. And this is a topic that really resonated with Sharon. She's also, as I mentioned, one of our C-suite coaches that you can get individual one-to-one -one coaching with. So I want to kick it over to Sharon and just offer some powerful opening remarks. Thanks, Angelina. And I am going to ask for a sound check because I had some technical difficulties. I can stand on my head, but I can't make my laptop work. So can you well, hear me? Can hear very well. Excellent. All right, then. Hello, everybody. So I am Sharon LaRue McClung. And among those other things, thank you, Angelina, for listing them. I am an imposter. Yeah. I am an imposter. I'm a professional imposter because my background is in theater. Um, I've been an actor and a career coach throughout my life. I see a lot of rich connection between coaching in corporate spaces and acting on stages. Like the well-known phrase, there are no small parts, just small actors. You've heard that one? Yeah. Expressing the idea that you don't have to be the star to be amazing. Do your best always, not just when the opportunity is center stage. The first time I heard that phrase, it was not meant to be uplifting. It was meant to shut me down. I had a tiny part in our fifth grade production about George Washington. I was in a group of cheerleaders whose sweaters spelled out his name. I was an E, not even a whole word, just a silent E. I wanted a big role like Martha Washington or Betsy Ross, and I was really upset. 
And my music teacher lost all patience with me because I refused to accept the phrase, there were no small parts, just small actors. Why was my disappointment solely my problem? Her reasoning behind her casting decision was that a musical about our founding fathers with a brown or black person in the lead role wasn't historically accurate and was never going to work. If only I could time travel and show my 10 year old self a $500 ticket to Hamilton. But that's a whole nother story. Sometimes the issue is with the part and not the actor, and we need to speak up for ourselves. I was gleeful when I saw an interview years ago with Kate Blanchett addressing speaking up for herself while making the movie Elizabeth. The director kept giving Kate the note that she needed to act more like a queen. She wasn't believable enough. Kate's response? The other actors needed to react more like she was the queen. She would be believable when she was believed. Ever wonder why award winners thank the supporting actor in their acceptance speech? Because there was support. Now, when I log into Zoom or walk into a conference room in the corporate world, I do not expect to be treated like royalty. And yet, I know I am not a lowly court jester. I am tired of wasting my time thinking I'm not good enough, or my previous work was just luck, or worse yet, missing a chance to present an amazing idea because worrying about being perfect keeps me silent. Did you know, according to some studies, 70% of all people experience imposter syndrome? And that percentage increases for people of color and for women. This means imposter syndrome is global. Even though it's called imposter syndrome, the implication being that there is something wrong with the individual. Is there something wrong with us when we stop to take stock in our abilities? What if we embraced the imposter? If we think of Shakespeare, I, I know, another dude in tights reference, bear with me. All the world's a stage and all the men and women are merely players. All the world's a stage. But who set the stage? Was the stage set for success? Success for everyone, including me, including you? And if the stage isn't set up for success, how can we change that? And while using our energy to change the stage so that it is set up for success, how do we maintain our energy and our enthusiasm for our work, our career, and our lives? Because this work is exhausting. And yet, here we all are, showing up to do it. To talk about feeling like and navigating imposter syndrome. We owe it to ourselves and to each other to know the possibilities of our next steps. We have studied our parts and they are not small. So let's raise the curtain and get on with this show. Places, everybody. Angelina, back to you. Sharon, that uh, gave me chills and made me tear up a little bit. I'm composing myself as I am <laughs> not. Uh, Thank you. Uh, and acting as you are, th th that was really beautiful and, and really set the stage on purpose, purposefully with intention for the conversation we are going to have today. I wanna thank you so much for your words and what you shared, beautiful places, everyone. Yes, in the chat, let's hear virtual claps for Sharon. Thank you so much. You're and I see, welcome. Thank you. And I see so many questions coming in. So I do want to make sure we'll have time to address those. But before we dive into the questions, and I have some questions of my own to get the conversation going, I want to introduce who we have 
to chat with us today, the experts that we're bringing to the table. And we have Marcel Fowler, who brings more than 30 years of experience in organizational effectiveness, talent development, internal communications, and leadership companies with such admired corporations like Capital One, Dow Chemical, and UPS. Throughout her career, she's coached and advised diverse groups of frontline managers, new hires, C-suite executives, and U.S. Navy commanders within the U.S. and also Japan. She holds a MBA from Georgia State University, a bachelor's in journalism from Michigan State University, and is an associate certified coach credentialed with the ICF. She's also a C-suite coach. Marcel is most passionate about helping others learn to trust themselves in ways that bring out the confidence, resilience, and leadership skills needed to fuel their growth and success. Thank you for being with us, Marcel. Thank you for having me. And thank you again, Sharon, for that amazing opening. I'm excited to be here, everyone. And we also have my dear friend, who I'm also just an overall fan of everything that she does, Minda Hartz. Minda Hartz is a workplace and equity consultant. She is also the best-selling and award-winning author of The Memo and Right Within. Her third book, You Are More Than Magic for Young Adults, will be released this spring, 2022. Minda is also a professor at NYU Wagner. She's a frequent guest on MSNBC, featured on ABC News, Forbes, Fast Company, Time Magazine. Minda is highly sought after speaker for Liberty Mutual, American Family Insurance, Nike, Google, Salesforce. That's just a few. In 2020, she was named the top voice for equity in the workplace by LinkedIn. And in addition, Minda hosts a live weekly podcast called Secure the Seat. Thank you for spending time with us today, Minda. Uh, thank you for inviting me, Angelina. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you. So I want to dive in and just ask both Marcel and Minda, and we can start with you, Marcel. When you define imposter syndrome to someone who's watching today, how would you define it if they're unsure, if they're experiencing it? Yeah, I think it may be different for everyone, but I think in general, it's just that sense that you're either unsure or unwelcomed or, uh, you know, unable to step into whatever the situation is, whatever the moment calls for and be successful. So that's it in a nutshell for me. And Minda, how about you? Yeah, I love that, Marcel. I love that definition. Uh, for me, I actually think about imposter syndrome in the tense of gaslighting yourself, right? And so oftentimes we talk about others gaslighting us, but I think imposter syndrome is when we throw the gas on ourselves and like, okay, girl, let me let me light you up. Let, 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 let you feel this, um, this heat that you shouldn't be giving yourself. And so, uh, you know, I want us to definitely dive into how we dismantle that lighter to our own selves. I love your way with words. Thank you so much. Uh, I love both of those comments and, and really helpful to set to understand what it is we're experiencing when we're going through it. Now, Minda, can you tell us a bit about some of your personal experiences with imposter syndrome and how have you changed your thinking? What are some of the tactics that you've used? Yeah, I love that question so much. I um I'll be honest with you, Angelina, and the rest of everyone here is that for a very long time, it's something that I constantly am trying to battle imposter syndrome. It's something that I realize, though, if I want to move forward, it cannot exist in my same space. The two cannot exist at the same time. If I have a growth mindset, if I want the best for myself, then I can't have this enemy state of mind. I really have to lean on that empire state of mind to, to realize what I have. And one of the things that I always question about myself, do I belong in the room, right? Because I was always the only black woman in the spaces that I worked at before. And so because I didn't see myself, I would always question why people would give me opportunities, even though I knew that my work, like you said, the, the data points demonstrated that I belonged in these rooms, but because I never saw myself or because people would speak over me or because I look young, people wouldn't take me seriously and I'm short and then there's that. And so I would just compile all these different stories. And the one thing that I wanna encourage everyone is that the stories that we tell ourselves about ourselves are just as important, 
right, than any other story that anybody else. So if we're telling ourselves that we don't belong, that why did they, did they do this because I'm black? Did they do this because I'm a woman? Then that just feeds that, that monster. And so I realized that that cannot exist if I want to advance in my career. I can't keep doubting myself at every turn. And so I shifted my mindset to say, I belong in every room that I'm enter, but maybe this room isn't the best for me. And if that is the case, then maybe I need to find other rooms to go into uh, or create my own, right? And so I think that I battled it. I still battle it. You know, even Maya Angelou, she battled it. She said that I wrote 11 books and every time she writes another, she's like, they're going to find me out, right? Now, if Maya Angelou is battling that, then, you know, it's, it's normal. But what is important to discuss is that it can't go with us. Imposter syndrome can't go where we're headed. And so I had to change the narrative for myself. Uh, but I've experienced it with my books. I've experienced it with a whole lot of things that I try for the first time. Like, who makes me the expert, right? And again, questioning ourselves. But I realized that our unique experience, our unique voice is valid for, for everything that we enter. Certainly. And I love that you call out so much about mindset. And that's been really top of mind and resonates a lot with my own experience lately as as we're trying to grow, as we're trying to expand, there comes a point where it really becomes something that can also hold you back. And Marcel, you're coaching a lot of executives as well as mid-career professionals, and you have throughout your career. As you've worked with clients who experience imposter syndrome, what are some of the tactics that you use and recommend to help them in their journey of overcoming it or working with it? Um, sure, Angelina, and I appreciate that you said working with it because I think one of the big things is, you know, just recognizing our, our emotions without judgment. A lot of times we start off with, we, we get in our own heads and we start saying, oh, I'm nervous, I'm scared, I'm not supposed to be here, who am I to be here, versus stepping back, and there's a term uh, Dr. Susan David calls emotional agility, stepping back and noticing what you're experiencing without judgment, you know? So noticing that even in preparing for this, maybe I noticed that I was, had the kid in my stomach, worried about something going wrong. And rather than saying it's bad, I taught myself to say, I simply, that, that simply means X. And in this case, it's, that simply means that this is important. This matters, that I want this to go well. So rather than constantly heaping judgment on ourselves, moving through, recognizing our emotions, focusing on what is it that we do want and being able to then say, okay, I can take action on those things that I do want. I can create more of what I want and in this space. And, and so getting them in that habit of being more self-aware, recognizing what they're experiencing, and then focusing on what they can control, what they can take action, what they can influence, and then reflecting on the results of it. Because often we don't reflect on what goes well. We don't reflect on the outcomes. We just reflect on the, the horrible things that go wrong. So when it happens again, rather than saying, hey, I've been there before and it went okay, we think everything is, oh, the first time again. We're, no, you've experienced something very similar before and you've moved through it successfully. So you can continue to do so. Absolutely. And I would just add to that, also keeping a catalog of your accomplishments, very simple, but very necessary because it comes to that point where you have to look at the data and say, I, to Mar what Marcel just called out, I've done this before, I've been here before, and if I've been here before, I can get through this again. So we have to remember we're in our own bubble sometimes and we can lose sight of all that we've accomplished and it's important to call that out. Also, recently there was an article from Harvard Business Review that challenged imposter syndrome. It called for others to stop using this term to excuse other workplace issues that we're experiencing, such as bias, racism, and they called out that feeling unsure shouldn't make you an imposter. That speaks right to what Marcel just called out. Bias and exclusion do exacerbate feelings of doubt, and confidence doesn't equal competence, that we should be fixing bias, not women. So that being said, love to kick it over to Minda, where you work and provide feedback to organizations and many capacities on these sorts of topics. Do you feel that there is a misrepresentation or even an overutilization of this term imposter syndrome in the workplace? 
Yeah, Angelina, I'm glad that you referenced that article because if others aren't aware of it, you definitely should um, should read it. It's a great article and uh, by two women of color. So I do believe that imposter syndrome is a social construct. I think that it is created the system to have those who feel like they're on the margins question uh, their worth and question if they belong in these spaces. Because let's be honest, um, the original table had mostly uh, dominant majority white male males at it, right? So it wasn't created for any of us. And so when you think about it, um, when you have a dominant group at the table, there is that bias. There is that kind of segregation. And so if you're not there or there's no seat for you, then you're going to feel like, wow, I, I must be the issue. I must be the problem. And we actually have to flip this on its head and say, no, the system is the problem, not me. And so it goes back again to the, the mindset. And I do think if we have um, bias job postings, hiring practices, you know, if you're fearful to go to HR, if psychological safety is not present, that is going to um, permeate in people's minds and, and again, have them second guess themselves. So it really is not on us. And I do think we should eliminate imposter syndrome out of our lexicon and not speak that on ourselves, right? I think we should, you know, gaslight it and put it away because it's not us. We have to continue to have hold leaders accountable, hold systems accountable to change it because systemic issues have to be have to be changed. And I think that once you understand that the system was created to make you question yourself, then you're like, wait a second, I'm not going to participate in my own oppression. I'm going to take this away, <laughs> right? So I, I talk a lot about the bias, the systems, the lack of safety inside of workplace that create those barriers. And if and I encourage all of our leaders. As you think about if imposter syndrome is present in your organizations and companies, what can you do as a leader to remove that, right? And I think that's where we can talk about these actionable solutions on how leaders in organizations remove those biases so that people do feel included. It's not enough to say diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging is important if we never demonstrate that. And in order to demonstrate it, then that will show others that they do, in fact, belong in these spaces. But going back to the point of it all, the stories that we tell ourselves about ourselves is very important. So reminding yourself that you do belong, it's just the system is whack, right? <laughs> I think you have to acknowledge that. Thank you. And Marcel, when you're working with your clients, how do you help them understand when there needs to be some work on developing themselves versus potentially there are challenges in their workplace and or when there's a combination of both what are the tactics that are best used in these sorts of scenarios yeah yeah angelina i think often it is a combination of both because what you'll see is that uh, often it's a matter of enabling them to think about what are the expectations and what is the feedback that you're receiving and to not allow ambiguous feedback to uh, impact your sense of self. So perfect example, someone needs more executive presence. Someone needs to show up more as a leader. You need to connect more with your team. These ambiguous terms tend to eat at us because we're not sure what does that mean really and what can I do about it? So we start feeling like, well, maybe I don't belong. And so working with, with coaches to help them think about how do you ensure that the feedback that you receive is actionable and what, how can you have a difficult conversation with your manager who's just saying, hey, you need to go do this, you, you need to go, um, you know, you need to show more presence, you know, you need to speak up more. What exactly is needed here? What, what do you expect of me? Give me an example. What does that look like? So helping coaches have those difficult conversations so that we no longer allow these ambiguous terms to impact our sense of self and to allow them to permeate the organization. So the feedback process in most organizations call for, people can just say, oh, you need to, you need to be more like X with no definition, no explanation, and then we're left to try to figure out what that really means. And often there's bias behind it. So it's making sure that we're able to have those tough conversations and equipping coaches with the language and, and what works for them in terms of having those conversations and challenging those constructs. 
Agree, definitely. And I'm seeing folks in the chat say, chat say we need to be asking for more clarity, getting rid of some of this ambiguity. Now the questions are coming in and I have many more, but I want to start addressing some of your questions. So I'll jump around. But the first one I see comes from Corinne and she asks, what advice do you have for those of us who are in mid-level management wanting to advance the corporate ladder, yet past mistakes, challenges make us feel like an imposter? Marcel? I'm sorry, um, for, I apologize. My uh, screen froze for a second, of course. So I heard, what is it that we need to do in the- If you've made in, past mistakes and you want to progress, but in the past, maybe there's been some reputation damage or challenges in your career. Sure. Um, I think one of the first things is first recognizing that, you know, you aren't your past. So the great thing is it sounds like the person recognizes that they've made mistakes. So it's getting into that, that learner mindset. What have I learned and what am I going to do differently? And how will I grow from here? And making sure that you, that you have those conversations with your manager, with leaders, with, you know, your sponsors, mentors, whomever to say, you know, we're turning the page. I'm recognizing that these are the challenges that I've had. Here's what I'm doing to address them going forward. And let's focus on going forward. Definitely. Thank you. And this one also comes from an audience member, and I will address this to Minda. I've noticed that many women feel they aren't good enough or worthy. In contrast, men don't seem to have these same hangups. How can women overcome this? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think we have to, it really takes uh, courage. Uh, one definition of courage is the ability to do something that frightens one. And I think that many of us have, um, in the words of Audre Lorde, we value fear over ourselves. And so I think a lot of men, they just go for it, right? They're not thinking about what others might be thinking about them. They don't let that kind of rule the day. And I think with women, we ruminate on so many different things, right? We play these stories in our head we tell ourselves these different stories and i think we really just have to lean into our courage and normalize women speaking up showing up for themselves creating boundaries those sorts of things so if we all start to do it then it's a normalized thing inside of the workplace it's not just oh i wish i could be more like angelina she seems so but if we all start seeing these role models, then it encourages the next woman to show up in her brilliance, show up in her glory, right? But if we never see these sorts of things, but then the other part of that is I think allyship. If we have men who are in these situations or others who you know, are more comfortable using their voice, how can we also set somebody else up for success, right? To help them along with it. So if you know that you're working with someone who is really awesome, but they, they kind of question themselves along the way, maybe this is when an ally could say, I noticed that Marcel, um, she'd been talking to me about some really amazing uh, projects she's been working on. Marcel, do you think you could share, do you feel comfortable sharing that with the group? You know, set somebody else up to be able to use their voice to, you know, validate them and affirm them that they do have good ideas, that they have those sorts of things. So if you are that person, you may not be in a space where you have an ally at the moment or a sponsor, but it's a good idea to have a coach, right? So if you don't have somebody in the room, connecting with C-suite coaches to make sure that somebody can coach you on that. Because, you know, there was a time in my life where I feared public speaking and there were up until not too long ago, and I'm just going to share this in pure transparency that I would have to actually go throw up in the bathroom before I get on screen to talk. I mean, legit uh, up until not too long ago, because my nerves, I'm very much an introvert and I realized I would just question myself, question myself. And I really had to have a, talking with myself and also with my coach and therapist to say, let's get down to the, to the foundation of where this is all coming from so that you can be your most healthiest and best self. And I think the more that we talk about this, I feel like we have to be our healthiest self. So we are not going to be our authentic self if we keep putting ourselves down or saying that we're making mistakes or this, that, and the other. And I love what Marcel said, you know, we are not our mistakes. And so at any given time, we get to redefine what success looks like but first bet on you. Know that you are worthy and that you do deserve it. Oh, so many good takeaways there. And I, I would have to echo that when you practice something and it becomes habit, it's a lot easier to do it, right? So if you position yourself to be more courageous, to go bigger, to have less hangups, and you make that a habit, it's a muscle that you can build. Now, 
Uh, keep your questions coming in the chat. We'd love to see them. I'll make sure we get to as many as we can. I want to go back to Sharon's opening remarks, which were so powerful. And in it, she shared the term imposter syndrome can imply that something is wrong with you. So how do we shift the blame from being internal and lose some of the negative connotations that are associated with it? Marcel? Yeah, so, you know, I, I think part of it is just, as I was saying before, it's um, recognizing that when we're experiencing what we've termed ourselves as imposter syndrome, it is focus on what, what are you experiencing without judgment, you know, and unfortunately, the term is out there. And so it's, it's one of those things where people just, yep, that's my symptom. So that's what I think I have. Well, what are you really experiencing? And how can you um, focus on, you know, how you can move forward, as we were saying before. And often with coaches, it's a matter of, you know, this is more of what I want, you know. Um, so if I want to learn to speak up in meetings and I'm feeling like I'm not showing up well, well, I really want to be of service to the client. So getting out of your head and, and, and thinking about, oh, this imposter syndrome is bad. It's, you know, this happens to be what I'm feeling. I'm feeling nervous about this. Uh, I want to speak up more. I want to be of, of service to the client. So focus on that and go ahead and, and speak up and think about if I'm not speaking up, then I'm not being of service to the client. I'm not, you know, serving my purpose here. And in fact, I had a coachee who, you know, that was exactly her situation. And she felt like she was an imposter because she was newer and, you know, more junior. So perhaps she shouldn't speak. And then realized she has a voice. She has something to share. There is a reason that she's there. And looked at the opportunity as just that. It's an opportunity to share feedback. It's not uh, success, pass or fail. It's just an opportunity to share information and then figure out, you know, what worked? How did it go? What doesn't work? How, you know, did it go well? Did it not go well? You know, what might I do differently? So if we start looking at our individual experiences and putting, putting such high stakes on them and see them as an opportunity to learn, to grow, to figure out what works, what doesn't, or what we might want to do differently, then that takes some of the pressure off ourselves to feel like everything is a pass fail. It's all about a learner. There's, as, as Minda mentioned earlier, the learner mindset, and there's a learner versus a judger. And so being more of that learner, what can I learn from this? What can I, uh, how can I grow from this experience versus looking at everything as this is a possibility for failure? No, this is a possibility to learn about myself, to learn about expectations, to learn more, of, to do something more. So looking at it from that perspective is helpful. What I'm hearing as a consistent theme is how important the language we use is and also our mindset. Uh, Minda, you're a master of language. In fact, you're coming out with your third book, third bestseller, I know for sure, entitled You Are More Than Magic for Young Adults. And if you could think back for if there are any young professionals in the room or those of you who are managing and engaging young professionals in the room, when you're young, how do you start to build this identity that really amplifies or helps you understand your worth early? What would you tell to anyone who's working with young people or any young professionals who might be in the room? Yeah, thank you for asking that, Angelina. I'm really excited about uh, my young adult book because what I realized was I had silenced my voice in the workplace when I was an adult, and but had I learned some tools as a young adult, a teenager, I might have been able to show up a little bit differently um, as a grown up in the workplace, you know, and so I, I think it really goes back to and I talk about imposter syndrome as a whole chapter in this book, because it's something that I want to make sure that we talk about very early with our young adults so that they don't take that with them. And one of the, the most, most important pieces, I think, is creating boundaries, right, and realizing that we can show up for ourselves, we can be our best advocates. Um, and you know, part of that, again, is knowing that your voice matters and that you matter and that your career matters. And if you don't have anyone affirming that, then knowing that there are people out there that, that want the best for you. So if you are working with young adults, I think it's important to not silence their voices early, because I think sometimes when you silence people's voices, then that makes them question themselves. And so we can say what we mean without saying it mean. We can create space for people to make mistakes 
and learn, right? Those sorts of things. And that it doesn't mean that they're stupid or these sorts of things, you know, it, depending on how you grew up, what you hear as a reinforcement when you're using your voice. And so I think that we should encourage our young adults and have mentorship programs and sponsorships so that we're taking them with us to meetings, so that we're encouraging them to, to weigh in on subject matters that they might not be the expert in, but they do have lived experience, right? And so again, I think we can empower each other as managers because my, my, in my opinion only, I believe managers should be removing barriers, not creating them. And so knowing that if you have someone who may not be as extroverted or as boisterous as some of your others, but including them in the conversation so that you're affirming them from the start. You might be 21, you might be 25, you might be 18, but your voice still matters here. And that's where equity it, uh, matters, right? So if we're talking about DEI at the core of it, equity. And so that means that everybody's voice matters. And so I think it's really important to encourage our young adults to start using their voices now and that they do have a lived experience. It may not be as senior as the person in the C-suite, but it's still applicable to the, the business development of the organization. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I see also comments that it starts really young, even creating space for a four-year-old child uh, because there's so much in this area that we struggle with. So really excited to have more hands on that book when it comes out. More questions in the chat and please do keep them coming. This one resonates with me because I'm an introvert as well. What do you suggest for introverts such as myself on how to address or handle opportunities where the other individuals seem to dominate the conversations and or meetings and not allowing others to have a chance to speak up. Marcel, I'll kick that one to you. Sure, and I get that a lot in um, coaching. One of the things I, I, I tell people is, you know, when you're in those meetings, you know, there's the opportunity to observe, you know, the body language and observe those, those uh, you know, those people who interrupt well, what is it that they're doing? Um, but also just, again, without being in your own thoughts, just recognizing that, you know, observe those, those spaces when someone just takes a pause and takes a breath. You know, so, so often we're preparing to speak that we never actually speak. So it's being able to be clear, you know, there's some things that I want to say and looking for those opportunities. And, and again, putting something out there without looking for it to be pass fail. But really, I'm looking for, I'm putting something out there and for the conversation, to further the conversation. And, and that helps with you feeling like, okay, I have something to say as well, and this is valuable. There's body language leaning in and looking someone in the eye as well. So that's a whole nother <laughs> thing about body language. But certainly looking for those opportunities where you can, and also when others interrupt, you know, what works well in that organization, in that culture, in terms of how people interrupt. And, you know, finding that language to say, yeah, I have something to add. You know, I have something I'd like to include. And, and making sure it's not wishy-washy. I just want to say, maybe I, I think this would be important as well, but truly stepping into it, I have something to add. Yeah, you, yes, and there's, some, there's another point, et cetera. So um, being able to find that language in advance for yourself so that it comes readily available, looking for those opportunities and focusing not so much on, you know, I, I want to say this, it's more of, uh, this is what I'm going to say, and, and here's how I'm going to introduce it. And it does become habit. So the more that you do it, the more you're able to feel comfortable with it. So I would give yourself some small goals in that area to really start the process of being more courageous in conversation. The other piece I would just add, because this is one of the questions that I did want to dive into, is what, are the, what is the role of the manager? And unfortunately, too often, we don't have any standardized trainings for managers when they go from being individual contributors to people leaders, but a good manager really should be understanding the dynamics of their team and advocating for those on the team that may have different styles of how they interact socially or how they want to engage. We can come back to that, but first I'd love Minda's perspective on this question that comes from the audience. How can we help clients determine the difference between imposter syndrome as a personal feeling or growth or development opportunity versus the culture of the organization or behavior of the manager specifically towards women of color? Yeah, that's a that's a big question uh, because I think you know again, Angelina, you mentioned, but it, it is a theme here <laughs> that it's a mindset 
thing too, right? And I think if you have been, so I'll make it personal. I spent 15 years uh, in corporate America and there wasn't a day that I didn't feel isolated or that I didn't belong, right? So when you're in those sorts of environments for a very long time, um, it starts to impede upon your mental health and how you see yourself, right? So you're questioning everything about everything because that's the only thing you know. We don't know what good looks like in some cases. And so um, I had to unlearn some of those things because I was actually letting the, the culture, the system dictate my worth. And I had to re release myself from that and, and realize that my authentic self is not one who has to question themselves at every turn, right? So um, understanding that this was, yes, it was a system in which I was working, but I am I have a decision, we all have a choice to tangle and dance and date with imposter syndrome, right? And I realized that I need to break up with this boo because this boo is not serving me, okay? And so I can't do my best work oppressed in this relationship, so I have to cut imposter syndrome off. I'm ghosting imposter syndrome. Can we all commit to ghost doing <laughs> imposter syndrome? Okay, I'm being crazy now. But, you know, so I realized that I had to let that go. Yes, the system is biased, but I can't also be a participator in the bias, right? So part of the equation, and Marcel mentioned it before, what, what can we solve? right? And we can be aware of feeling we are not good enough to deserve it, as Audre Lorde said. So we can participate in taking that away. The other piece of the puzzle is our managers and leaders. We have to, knowing that we may work at the same place and experience that workplace differently, how are our women of color experiencing this workplace differently? I need to be having conversations with them and say, what do you need from us to do the best work of your career? why you're here, right? Asking those good questions about what people need. So yes, just because I'm on a virtual call and maybe somebody has their camera off doesn't mean they're watching Tinder Swindler. It means that maybe something else is going on, right? And I need to ask them, you know, what, you know, what support they might need, or I might notice that those certain dominant voices are always carrying the conversation. But I know because of my one-on-ones with, with Brenda that she has a lot of good advice. So as a manager, I know what her strengths are and I know for areas that I can push her on. So I'm going to ask her to participate in these ways. But I think we need emotional, intelligent managers that understand that we can't just go to our go-to people and that's enough. How are we investing in everyone on the team? And I think it goes back to not just the articulation, but the demonstration. How are we demonstrating that everybody is worthy in this environment, that everybody should have access to opportunities? And that is culture, right? So who's responsible for culture? Obviously everybody is, but if you have people in leadership, then some of that, a lot of it is uh, your responsibility. So I think we all have to figure out, you know, what are those resources? Do we need, do we need coaching, right, to help us get that? And I think, again, I love the work that you do at CC Coach, Angelina, and your coaches, because a lot of managers have never been trained on how to engage with their, with their staff, right? And you don't know how to get the best out of others if no one's ever shown you how to do it. And so I think, um, companies really should be investing in the in the development of their leaders so that they can pull the most out of their team as well. And I think that will help eliminate some of this feeling of not belonging and imposter syndrome and questioning. That was powerful. And if you've broken up with imposter syndrome before we get off this call, I need to know what is the name of the new boo that you're now <laughs> that you've now embraced if, if that's the old boo. We do have one hand raised. So I would like to address this and uh, in the, uh, please just keep your comment concise so we can get to as many questions as possible. But Rashida, would you like to come off mute and address your question? Oh, maybe that was an accidental hand raise. All right, well, we have some many more questions in the chat. Any suggestions as to how to bolster teammates on a peer-to-peer -peer level when they may not feel empowered in the workplace? Marcel. Well, that's a good question. I think that um, you, you know, that's really important because oftentimes, you know, we think about uh, needing those those mentors and sponsors and allies, but really, it's you know our peers who often are there who are able to pull us aside and say, "Hey, is everything okay? Hey, how are you doing?" And having those real conversations with us about how things are going that we can. Um, share um, and feel that psychological safety. So I think one of the things is making sure that they are, as we said before, 
recognizing what they bring to the table and making sure that they're aware of the, the successes that they had. I remember seeing a meme once where there was a, a character standing on two sides, it was a little graphic and it's, hey, you did great, thanks. But then on the other side was, oh, you, you know, you didn't do well, you should have done this, you should have done this. It's like we, when something doesn't go well, we take, you know, 20 things to heart. When something goes well, it's, okay, thanks, yeah. <laughs> so often those peers, can remind us of the things that we do well, the things that are really, you know, that we bring to the table. And also in terms of, you know, if you're not feeling as empowered in the workplace, you know, often our peers are the ones who we can practice those conversations. If we need to have a difficult conversation and, and, and more advocate for what we want and have that self agency, our peers can be there as well. So it's so valuable for that support in so many different ways. Yes, peers are powerful. But this question in the chat asks, what if you don't have peers that look like you? So what if there are no other women, let alone women of color in your workplace? What are some of the ways to navigate being confident in your abilities and what you bring to the table if you're one of the only? Minda? Yeah, that's an important question because sometimes we are the only or one of few. Uh, so I think that it's important to come to sessions like these where you can build community. So if you're not uh, in a position where you have a, a ERG that you can tap into, an employee resource group or a business resource group, that would be a good way to build community. Um, I, it's something that I wish I would have had access to in my career, but I know I hear from a lot of my peers who are one of few, they get to connect with other people of color or women in these different groups. Um, so definitely take advantage of that if your company has one. But then also, again, create the community. You, you can come to the events that C-Suite Coach hosts. Um, you, there's LinkedIn events. Um, I host a show every week called Secure the Seat on LinkedIn. And so there's community there. So tap into your social community, too, because we are here to support you. Uh, and and, and uh, I think it's important to resources, books, podcasts, you know, utilize some of these invisible mentors out online and, and let that fill your cup because I think sometimes we'll just suffer in isolation, but there are ways for us to be uh, in community. And so I'm sure if you drop it in the chat, people will definitely want to stay connected and, and we're continuing to root for you right along with you. Thank you for that. And I'll take one more audience question for now before diving back into some of mine. This one would be be for you, Marcel, how are imposter syndrome and identity related if we, if your identity defines how you feel about yourself? Yeah, you know, that's a, a great question, especially, you know, um, some of the people I coach, when you talk about the organizations, really the, their imposter syndrome stems from their cultural backgrounds, their families, and recognizing that, you know, uh, my well-intending mom, I was telling her about an opportunity that I had ahead of me and I was really excited and confident about it. And she said, well, don't get, you know, you're not that kind of, you, you know, just be careful with one of those, you know, you don't be too big, you, you know, don't get too big for your britches. Don't act like you're better than God kind of thing where it was just me saying, you know, I, I've done all I can do. I'm excited. And I really think I got this. And, you know, and often in some cultures, it's don't stand out, just be grateful just to stay, you know, keep your head down, be grateful for the opportunity. Um, you know, don't be you know, an individual, you really be a part of this community and, and just, just focus on that. And so we get that as part of our identity. And I think it's important to recognize that, you know, who we are and you know, who we may need to be in this situation is, um, you know, a function of, recognizing, as, as Minda said before, a choice. So who I am to my family <laughs> and, you know, my mom who's trying to keep me safe, who's making sure I'm humble and not trying to be bigger than God is not the me that I need to be in this situation. And I don't need to be kept safe and I don't need to be, um, I, I recognize that something's a blessing and to whom much is given, much is expected. So often we have to reshape those, those expectations of our identity that were put on us uh, culturally or from a um, family perspective and think about who am I now and who, who is it that I need to be to be successful and to get more of what I want to be and where, where I want to be. Wow, that was really powerful and resonated with me a lot. 
our expectations, I think even about this next generation and how bold they can be. I've been seeing them called the boundaries generation and their expectations of work are very different even than millennials. And when millennials came into the workplace, we were just wild, right? Uh, so it is a relearning and a rethinking because what used to be acceptable to us in the past and what we used to see as appropriate uh, in terms of goals and expectations at work continues to shift. So that is really powerful. Thank you. Now, as we stated earlier, or actually we, we chatted about this uh, offline, as many as 70% of Americans have experienced these feelings known as imposter syndrome, but research shows a racialized component that intensifies its impact on the mental health of black individuals, more specifically black women, what are some specific resources that every Black woman needs to thrive and truly be successful in the workplace? And Minda, this is your lane. I'm going to kick this first to you. Ah, well, thank you. You know, I so because we're talking about imposter syndrome, Angelina, and we're talking about language, I think as Black women, uh, again, making sure that we're filling our cup because we're not always in a room where somebody else will do that for us. And so I used to say, oh, you know, forgive me for this shameless plug, but I don't believe in shameless plugs. I believe in plugs, right? So I do believe that the memo, my, my book, the memo, What Women of Color Need to Know to Secure a Seat at the Table is a good resource just to affirm yourself and just to remind yourself of certain things. But then I also think it's important to... Um, also connect with therapy therapists and coaches as resources. I know that um, sometimes when we have some unlearning to do and we need to break up with some, some habits, um, it may be hard to do it on our own and our success is not a solo sport. And so another resource is um, therapy for black girls. Definitely get on there if you need a therapist. And then also I, I'd say the last one is c-suite coach i think if you need a coach <laughs> you need to and i believe everybody should have one because if you are the star of your team every star needs a coach and so how can you utilize a coach to help you put your best foot forward be your most healthiest and authentic self and i think sometimes we are so in the weeds of our own um garden that we we don't see some of the great things that are happening and somebody else can remind us about how awesome we are and, and those sorts of things i have and I, I lied. One final thing, get a good girl squad or a good squad of people around you. So those moments where you can't get to the therapist or you can't get to the coach, you get in that group text and have a friend or two that can hype you up um, and send you a good voice note or just something to remind you because all of these different things are our treatment plans, right? To our, to make sure that we are our most healthiest self and to make sure that boo don't come lurking again. You need some, you need some people on your team to make sure that they, they stop that imposter syndrome from trying to come back. So those are just a few that I think would be helpful. Thank you. And we're sharing the links to Minda's books in the chat. And for C-Suite Coach, what I can share is that we have been very intentional about curating a diverse group of coaches. There are many coaching programs and there is another place where we need more representation. So if you look back at any of our C-Suite Coach chats or take a look through some of the coaches on our website, you will see that we have been extremely intentional about finding a diverse cohort of coaches to work with you. Now, I want to, we're getting to the point of close, so if there are any final questions, please do throw it in the chat. But I also want to make sure that we talk about best practices for a champion mindset. So we talk about uh, imposter syndrome, we're being careful with our language, and, and instead of thinking about that, now I want us to think about what is that champion mindset. So maybe that's your new boo, Minda, or let me know what you call your new boo. But what are some of the best practices that help you maintain that Minda? And then for Marcel, what do you advocate your coachees do? Uh, yeah, so my, my new boo is abundance, right? And so I think that when we talk about imposter syndrome, that is a limiting story about ourselves. We're limiting our um, experiences, our opportunities, and those sorts of things. And so we don't have time. As, as Maxine Waters said, I'm reclaiming my time. It's time for us to reclaim that. And so that's what I do. I'm, I'm replacing those negative thoughts with things that are of abundance and edifying to my mind, spirit, and my body. And so uh, that self-talk is very, very important. And so for me, Angelina, it's very much about my well-being. And so making sure that I'm not engaged in conversations with 
with people and entities that would make me feel less than, right? So I make sure I'm very careful about what I allow in my space and even what songs I listen to or programs that I watch, all those sorts of things, because th those little things seep back in and, and can influence the way that you move forward. And as I said at the top, um, imposter syndrome in my path forward cannot coexist at the same time. One has to go. And so which one is leaving? And, we, and, I'm, and I'm pushing that. So I'm constantly reminding myself. The last thing, my therapist, this one's for free for everybody. My therapist always asks me, Minda, what do you need to be your best self for today? And, when, and I would encourage everybody to ask themselves that question every day. What do you need to be your best self? And so thinking about those things that make you not feel like your best self and eliminating those things so that you can have that growth and winning and champion mindset. And so a lot of it is that self-work, I do believe, is important. I echo that completely. When you, if you take some time to reflect and journal how you react when you're in the best space and having the best day versus how you react when you're stressed, when you're tired, when you're mentally exhausted and you see you are, your, your reactions are different, how you engage is different, your strengths are different and they come across differently. So I echo what Minda says completely. Marcel. Yeah, you know, and along with that, I think it's also important to, for some, to recognize that for some people, when trying to have that champion mindset, affirmations don't work. And what I mean by that is there's some cognitive dissonance between what we're telling ourselves and what our mind, our brain is telling us when we say, you're the best, you can do it. And your brain is like, no, you're not. No, you can't. So that's why it's so important to capture those things that we do well. You know, Angelina mentioned a brag book, you know, and or I think you've talked about that before, or I've had a coachee who started an awesomeness journal. Whatever it is, just capturing those things where you're confirming for yourself, this is what I've done. You know, spending a few minutes at the end of a day or end of a, a work week or end of a tough assignment, capturing it for yourself or even a difficult conversation of, you know, this really went well so that you start having a mental note so that the next time, rather than an affirmation that your brain is telling you that's empty, won't work, doesn't matter, that's not you, you actually have confirmation. And then even when things don't go well, you can just look at that as information. So, okay, this didn't work, fine. I will make some adjustments and move on to next time. So I always try to get people to think instead of, you know, affirmations and feeling like that's the only thing available to me, you think about confirmation. And if, when things don't go well, think about information. What information did you gain? And keep, and keep that going. So many powerful tools there. And hopefully, as you all are thinking about how to fortify yourselves, how to work on shifting mindset, these are all tools that you can use. We heard so much, uh, really taking care of yourself, being clear on your language, losing some of the ambiguity in conversations with your employers and your teams, and really defining what their expectations are of you, challenging them to be more inclusive as managers. So lots of great, great fuel here to take us into the next month. Now, a couple of quick housekeeping things I wanna let you all know about. Our next C-Suite Coach chat is live. It will be April 6th. Jackie has shared the link in the chat. We will be talking about influence and persuasion. We wanna make sure that you also take note of Minda's new books or Minda's new book and also buy the other bestsellers that exist. So we've shared those links in the chat as well. I see some conversation going about new boos. Go ahead and tweet who your new boo is at Minda Hearts on Twitter, at us at C Suite Coach. We want to hear what new boo is going to be entering your life this season as we really change and shift our language and we ghost imposter syndrome. I want to share a huge thank you to Sharon for your powerful words today. I also want to be sure to thank Marcel Fowler and Minda Hearts for all that you shared. And did I miss anything? Is there any other way we should be keeping in contact with you? Minda, did I hit it? Did I hit uh, it <laughs> You hit it, girl. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you to each and every one. I'm, I'm rooting for your, for your continued um, healthy relationship with your new boo. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. And of course, if you are interested on one to one coaching, please do make sure you take a look at our website. We also have forms that you can use to help your employer pay for your coaching. So if you need any assistance with that, please do check that out ASAP. 
Thank you again. And we hope to see you all in the April 6th next C-Suite Coach Chat.